Notice the name on the chalkboard, Brunus Shelley, kind of date 1415. He was a Renaissance architect in Italy, and it is reliably surmised by historians that he's a guy that invented perspective in 1415. Perspective is an invention. It's a formulation. It's a system. Long before Brunelleschi, however, let's go back to the Stone Age. Let's, let's think about cave drawing. Anybody who was a serious uh, visual communicator wanted the ability to show to people looking at their art the relative positions of things and to one another and in relation to uh, a stationary viewer. You know, we move in relation to things and things move in relation to us. And it not being a static world, it's a huge, great skill to have to be able to render through an understanding of linear perspective things in different positions. So the word perspective can have a correlation very simply to vantage point, viewpoint. Okay. Now, way before Brunelleschi, again, going way back prehistoric times, people who drew had an intuitive, non-mathematical, non-formulated sense of creating pictorial communication that stated the relative positions of things. Now, let me diagram very quickly what these, some of these very prehistoric systems were. First of all, it was understood that if you drew an object and then placed another one above it, that could indicate that that higher object were further away. Now, if you think about it, why is that? That's because we understand something about a horizon. We feel an implied horizon. And perhaps this is working for, for us even today is because we, we have that implied sense of a horizon. But as time goes on, this intuitive system develops. It's later understood or felt that if you change the size of one of the objects, particularly the one up above, and you have a scale relationship, and that sense of the upper form being further away is even greater. And then the final evolution of this very prehistoric system is to allow the larger foreground form to overlap the smaller, higher, seemingly distant form. So just to summarize, we have vertical placement. We have the use of scale. And we have Vertical placement, scale, overlapping. That's what I've just run through. I think you'll agree that as fundamental as those systems are, they really do work. And later on when I show you art history slides, or I'll do a PowerPoint about art history running through the world from uh, tens of thousands of years ago to present, and in every case, looking at perspective, analyzing how perspective is used by artists. You'll see that at the caves of Lascaux in, in France, you'll see every one of these basic principles applied. When was that? 20,000 BC, something like that. All right. Everything I'm talking to you about today pertains to one-point perspective. We'll address two-point perspective later separately. And we're going to be talking first about boxes. Everything I'm going to show you in one-point perspective begins with boxes. Think cube, think box. We're going to build upon those boxes incrementally, step by step by step. 
Okay, now we'll start with something very important to tell you. In one point perspective, there is always a frontal plane. This I call a frontal plane. It is perfectly parallel to you. It's not angled one way or another, flat up against you. It's as if you were in a theater. You were sitting front row center, looking flat on it to the stage. Okay? And something paralleling the stage would parallel your picture plane. That's a frontality situation. So I'll say this a lot. In one point perspective, there's a frontal plane. Now, if you're dealing with squares or rectangles, right angle corners. In two point perspective, I'm just jumping ahead for a second, everything juts towards you. The sides of objects in two point perspective recede into the distance, recede into the distance. But in one point perspective, there's frontality. It's very important. So in one point perspective, you have lines of particular categories. You've got perfectly vertical lines and perfectly horizontal lines. And the third category is all the lines that just go at various angles back to a vanishing point. And those are called receding parallel lines. The scientific name is orthogonal. I'm not going to even spell that for you. I'll just say receding parallel lines. Now, you know that these lines are not on a drawing. These lines are, they seem to be tapering back to a point. And they're not really parallel in the drawing. But what they refer to are the lines in which in real life, and I'm pointing to them now, that are indeed parallel. So it could be a little confusing to say receding parallel lines where on your drawing they're tapering to a, a point. But it, it's important to start to cover some terminology. These are words that I'll be using. Receding lines, receding parallel lines. I'll be nagging at you to keep your horizontals perfectly true and straight up and down, and your horizontals perfectly, perfectly horizontal, not crooked. If your verticals and horizontals are crooked, your assignments are going to really be whacked out. So there's a certain amount of precision that's going to be necessary in these one and two point perspective assignments. All right, now, let's, um, I'm going to show you the, the basic scheme for how to draw a box in one point perspective, and we'll take it from there. I'll start with the horizon line. And the horizon line for today is just going to be my, the height of my eye. I'm just going to be very literal and make the horizon line roughly here. Now somewhere along that horizon you can establish a vanishing point. It could be anywhere. It could be here, it could be here, it could be center. Just arbitrarily I'm going to put it here. And I'm going to mark that vanishing point VP. In one point perspective, there should only be one vanishing point. This is very important. It always happens that somebody in class ends up with more than one vanishing point in a one-point perspective drawing. How does that happen? Well, that would be wrong. When you're dealing with systems, there is a right and a wrong. This isn't subjective. This is more like math and science. And by the way, this isn't the entirety of the class. This kind of precision and systematic working is up front Later on, it becomes more individualized. We start with line, we move to full shading, but we start with structure. You can begin to draw a box by drawing the frontal plane. I'm going to draw a box to the left of my vanishing point and below my horizon line. So there's the frontal plane with my right angled corners. Now what's missing? 
what's missing? We're missing a top, and we're missing a side. We're missing a top, and we're missing a side. Three important points. These corners, very important. Draw a receding line from this corner back to vanishing point, as well as from that corner and that corner. You can, be, you can begin to see, right, how the top and the side is going to be formed. Now you know, uh, you have a sense of what a box is or a cube is. Let's say I'm drawing a cube. I'm going to estimate Now you notice how I tried to keep my vertical very upright and my horizontal true. So here's the completed box in one point perspective. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's say that box drops down lower and slides over to the left you're going to see more of the top and more of the side. Your perspective changes. So the top, as it drops, you see more, more and more fully upon it. It seems a little bigger. And the, the sliver of the side, as the, the box moves leftward, becomes larger too. So I'm going to draw a box here, and again, go back to VP, but it would be a mistake to make this side equal to this. So whatever this is, I make it a little bit, a little bit wider. I'm using my fingers like calipers, you see? And where that line comes up and hits this receding line, you cut across. All right. Now, my boxes are overlapped, but you can see it, right? The proportion of the top is fuller than this. The proportion of the side is fuller than this. That's very important that you, you understand that not everything is the same, right? It, it's like there's going to be essential differences from one position to another. So this is what I would eventually ask you to do. I would ask you in your first independent exercise to draw a horizon line and a vanishing point and to draw, not too large, to draw in different positions several frontal planes and to complete them as cubes. Now this one is further left of this, so I'm going to make sure that I see more of it. And as you can see, I'm being very sketchy. Now, what's going to happen here? Some of you already know the answer, obviously. I know some of you have experience with this, probably from high school or even earlier. You have a, a frontal plane almost immediately below your vanishing point center with it. Therefore, you don't see a side or another side dead center. You see a front and you see a top.
Now, how full should this be? Look at this. This is the narrowest top because it's closest to horizon. This is a little fuller because it's starting to fall. This is the fullest because it's the lowest. So the depth or the fullness of this top needs to be between these two. And I could fairly, reasonably say it's like that. This is going to be one of your exercises that I'll ask you to do independently. And then I'm going to ask you to shoot an image of it and we'll examine them digitally. Um, you'll be putting several frontal planes below as well as above your horizon line. So it's, it's, it's not a big change. It's the same system, but it's the other way. You come down towards the key. This is quite close to this. It's not slid over very much. I don't want to make that too full. Okay, and I think you would know what to do to complete those. Now, now that we've drawn boxes, we can take those boxes and start to build with them. I'm going to move the BP over. I have an idea. I'm going to do something a little different. Um, this is not going to be a cube. This is going to be a rectangle. But it is a frontal plane. And I'm going to make that frontal plane deeper, more like a long box. See, not a cube, but something longer, deeper. And that's going to be the first step in uh, a stair step. We're going to aggregate, multiply this box logically, and build a stair step. Now you could, you could use your finger like calipers, or if, you know, you'll be work working smaller. You'll be working on a, a newsprint pad to work this out, which is 18 by 24. But I'm just going to take my fingers, calipers. I don't have a ruler. And I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to use a ruler anyway, because it's I don't think I need to be that fastidious on this large scale. See what I've done? I've just duplicated that frontal plane, or tried to duplicate it. And then what's it tight? And go up. Right? It's like stacking building blocks. That's all it is. Like what we did when we were kids. How do you complete this? Some of you already know, but I'm going to indicate in red those important corners that you project receding lines from. Receding line back to VP, receding line back to VP. Now, how do you connect those two boxes? This is a very critical area in here. I'm putting red dots on the corners. And this corner goes straight up. And where that intersects this receding line, you go straight across with the horizontal. There is step number two. And as you can surmise, let's do one more. This time, however, I'm just going to, I'm going to take this and build up. 
and take a shortcut. You see what I've done? I'm not going to do the building block thing. I just took a, a shortcut. Let's make sure this, tr this riser is, yeah, it's not bad. Should we go one more? Yeah, let's go one more. Riser. Tread. I guess these are architectural terms. The riser, the tread. See what's happened. Look at the tops of these stairs. The one down below is fullest because it's, as we did before, the lower you go from horizon, the more you're looking at it aerially and the fuller, the bigger the top is. And as that top approaches horizon, it gets thinner and thinner and thinnest. Okay, let's go one more. Let's see what happens if we pass over the horizon line. I'm gonna take this tread this is riser, the riser, excuse me. Here's the tread. And now we're over, we're above the horizon line. What's going to happen? We're not looking down on the stairs anymore. We're looking up at one of those stairs now. The very last stair we're looking up at. I just follow the system. Here's a corner. Back down to VP. Corner, 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 corner of the previous step. I'm marking out for you the corners in red so you can see the, the shape of that very skinny top. And as before, from this rare farthest away corner, you come up, and that's it. You're looking at this final upper stairway from below. Your horizon line is under the top of that stair, so you cannot see the top of it. All right.